it is seriously an honor to be here with so many inspiring people. And, and the thing that's so exciting right now is that never before in history, I don't think, has publishing been shifting and changing so much. And nobody knows where it's going. If anyone tells you, I know where the book is going, they don't know what they're talking about. And so to be able to connect with people like you who are actually doing things, amazing things, interesting things, and be able to try to help you maybe connect those ideas and those doings with publishing and books is a great, great honor for me today. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me. So I'm going to be talking about post-artifact books and publishing. And I'm just going to jump right into the big do because I want you to keep this in mind as I'm giving the entire presentation. And the big do is very simple because I think do's should be simple. Because do's, big things, big change is just little small incremental actions writ large over time. And so my big do for you is publish. It's for everyone to think about it, to consider it. How can I connect what I'm doing with publishing and with books? Now, books and me, you know, I was one of these lucky guys who had a mom that read to him every night from when he was a kid. And I'm sure many of you had that too. So I grew up around books, and I grew up inspired by books, and I grew up in love with books, Dick and Jane's, The Hardy Boys. When I was in fourth grade, I was certain I was going to be a novelist, or else I was going to be a thespian who performed novels for elementary school children, which is what I was doing in third and fourth grade, because I loved it, and I loved where those stories took me. So whenever I go to a new city, whenever I travel, the first thing I do is go to a bookshop, because I think that says something about the place you're in. Looking at the books, looking at the way they respect books, how they make books. So when I was 19, I had the opportunity to go to Tokyo. And the first stop I made was at Kinokuniya Bookstore, which is the biggest bookstore in Tokyo. And I was blown away. It was phenomenal. This was unlike anything I had ever seen before. The minimalism, the restraint, the use of material and shape and object. There was a greater sense of what these books were meant for than I had ever seen before. And certainly more so than in the West, where we kind of tended to make books as paperbacks, as throwaways. These were things you didn't throw away, even the paperbacks. And this was mass market stuff. And that really stuck with me. That was an inspiring thing. The use of shape, the use of form, white space, a sense of the object. So when I was 21, I had the opportunity to help, help found a publishing company, and my MO for that publishing company was simply to make the most beautiful books I possibly could as a designer. I had never made a book before. I had never studied how to make a book before. But I had this image from when I was in Tokyo of what these perfect books were like. And so we started making books. We started making books that would be the books. The idea was if you're moving and you're cleaning out your junk and you're throwing away old clothes, and you're, you get to the bookshelf and you're taking these old paperbacks off and you're getting rid of some of them, some of them you're, you're giving some away. These would be the books that you get to on that shelf and you pull off and you think to yourself, I can't give this away, I can't get rid of this. this these are the books that last 100 years, 150 years. So I was obsessed with the idea of an artifact and the, the idea of a book as an artifact. And we were able to connect a lot of these ideas. We were able to use books as pivot points to help communities. We went to New Orleans with one book, and we were able to energize around the post-Katrina <laughs> New Orleans, the Ninth Ward. We went down there, and we were able to help uh, rebuild and use this book to fund uh, support and, uh, and, and rebuilding of some of these amazing places in the Ninth Ward that were destroyed. So I've always been using books as a pivot point. You know, they've always been not an end result. I've never been totally obsessed with the artifact as an artifact, even though I was trying to make the most beautiful artifacts as I could. I was curious about the conversation that came from those artifacts. And so I spent a decade of my life because I actually studied computer science and fine arts at university. And so on one hand, I'm making, trying to make the most beautiful books I possibly can, which I don't know if I achieved that or not, but you know, I tried my hardest and I worked with local producers and local, local suppliers in Japan and using their traditional publishing methods and paper types and, and resources. We never went abroad. We always used local. And then on the other hand, I was doing this weird, bizarre, data visualization, data mining, looking for stories in information online, and taking those stories and trying to find hidden narratives, you know, taking that data and looking for the hidden narratives. So on one hand, I'm dealing with media that's hundreds of years old. On the other hand, I'm dealing with media that I'm creating on the fly because no one had worked on this stuff before. And so when January 27th, 2010 came around, this was the day looking back on it now of the death of the artifact. And it's the day that my schizophrenia of this digital and analog 
bipolarization came together because on this Wednesday, and the weird thing is, being a Wednesday, uh, you know, Wednesdays are usually pretty boring. Uh, but this January 27th, 2010, was a little more interesting because the iPad came out. Suddenly, this, this world of, of, of artifact and this world of, of digital uh, engagement seemed to, in single device, become embodied in a way that maybe you can start to think about artifacts, the physical artifacts, in the same way on a digital device. And everyone in the publishing industry and everyone who's making books had, in, 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 in synchronicity, we all thought the same thing. We all asked the same thing. We all asked, how do we get books into digital devices? How do we take a book? How do we take a paperback and shove it into the iPad? And while the problem is, is that this was the wrong question to be asking, looking back now. There's a more fundamental and interesting question. It's not how do we shove these old media books into these new media devices. It's how does digital affect books? The difference is really subtle, but it changes the entire way you think about publishing and the way you look at books. And as a corollary to this, what is the form of a genuine digital book? When you ask, how do we get books into digital devices, you're focusing on the artifact. You're focusing on that output. A great example of someone who did this right away is Wired. Wired said, how can we take this magazine, this dead media object, and shove it into the iPad? And well, they did just that. They shoved it in there and added nothing of value to the reading experience beyond being able to read it on the iPad. They ignored all of the wonderful uh, advantages that being digital brings to text. And I think all of the designers and, and people involved with books, when we opened up this Wired iPad app and we started flipping through and we realized we can't resize the fonts and we can't copy and select anything and that it was 550 megabytes, we thought, damn it, it's the 90s all over again. It's CD-ROMs all over again. It's superficiality for superficiality's sake. It's kitsch. So if how do we get the books into digital devices deals with the artifact, the way to get around that is to kill the artifact. Now, ladies and gentlemen, come with me 20 years ago to when, if you didn't know the population of Germany, you had to look it up in an encyclopedia. And in 1993, Microsoft asked the question. They said, how can we take this giant encyclopedia and shove it into these computers? Windows 3.1 was on the rise. Everyone thought CD-ROMs were of the future. And so what they produced was Encarta. How many people here have used Encarta? How many people know Encarta? Almost everybody. They package this thing with every computer. How many people actually used Encarta to look something up and then cited that afterwards? Nobody. We didn't use this thing. We didn't use it because it was too slow. It was, again, this gloss, this sheen of superficiality overlaid on top of encyclopedia. It was asking the wrong question. It was saying, how do we shove this physical thing into a digital device? And they did it in all of the wrong ways. In fact, I think that a giant text file of the encyclopedia would have been more useful than Encarta. So I never used that. Even though I was 13 when Encarta came out, and I loved computers and I loved books, for me, it held no interest. I remember loading it up and looking at it for a few minutes and going, oh, oh great, I'm going to go back to my normal encyclopedia. So in 2001, when Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger said, let's rethink encyclopedias, they didn't say, how do we take an encyclopedia and shove it into the internet? They asked, how does digital affect encyclopedias? How does digital change that core ethos of an encyclopedia? And we all know the end result was Wikipedia. And when they launched this, they said hundreds of thousands of people will be able to, able to edit this at will. They'll be able to change it. That artifact, that, that hard artifact that we're so used to with the printed media suddenly becomes really ephemeral. It becomes really fuzzy. Everyone said it's going to be garbage. The fact of the matter is, and we know that now it wasn't garbage unless you're Ed and you're using it to look up the, the source of the Amazon River. The way they, they, they did Wikipedia, they used digital to modify that core system by which encyclopedias were created. And they were able to build a community around that ethos, that history of the encyclopedia, that allowed them to maintain a, a level of standard that was higher than anyone expected them to be able to achieve. And now the thing I want you to really pay attention to is that if you look up monkey in in, on Wikipedia, and this is Japanese monkey, and if you take that and print it out and you bring it over to a physical encyclopedia, and you look at that printout and you look at monkey in a physical encyclopedia, that end artifact is going to be almost identical. But the, the path between let's make it a, mon a monkey entry and that final output in Wikipedia and the, the path between that for Encyclopedia Britannica are fundamentally different. They're completely different, even though the ethos of that object is the same. And so James Bridle, who's in the class, or who's in, not the class, but who's in the, uh, the room right now, 
James uh, decided to take uh, the Iraq war entry for Wikipedia. He wrote scripts to look at all the revisions over time. And then he wrote scripts to lay out all those revisions in a book. And he printed it out. And what he ended up with was the 12 volume set of the Iraq war for Wikipedia. And the thing that's lovely about this is that this is a physical manifestation of that, that idea, of that system that's so different than anything we've used to get to that final artifact up until this point. It's essentially an artifact of a system that destroys the very idea of artifacts, which is what that Wikipedia system has, has brought, to, brought to the table. So by focusing on the artifact, it causes you to miss all of these amazing, fundamentally important things that digital brings to the table. And in 2009, as a side note, I didn't even know Encarta was still being sold, but 2009 it finally went off the shelves. So the question of how does digital affect books and also how does it affect publishing? I want to give you an example, a story of two books. And this is a book uh, I co-authored two years ago with Ashley Rollins, and it's about the Tokyo art world. And now these books may look the same, but actually the story behind them is very different. Does anyone out here know Kickstarter? How many people know of Kickstarter? Good, 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 good. A lot of people don't. Great. Kickstarter is this really amazing site that lets you essentially microfinance or microfund or crowdfund, however you want to explain it, creative projects. So I had this book, Art Space Tokyo, that was published two years ago in a traditional way. And it, it sold out in about a year, and then we never got around to republishing it because of money issues and because of, because of other things. But Kickstarter came out about a year ago, and I saw this and I thought, great, I'm going to use this to reprint Art Space Tokyo. So I set up an account on Kickstarter, and I put up Artspace Tokyo. And the way Kickstarter works is that you set a period of time. You set a time limit, so say one month. For Artspace Tokyo, you said, all right, we're going to do this in one month of fundraising, and we have to get $15,000, or else we're not going to do this project. And the way Kickstarter works is that you go and you pledge. You say, you set up your tiers. So if you, you, you pledge $25 to the project, you get a PDF. $65 gets you the book. $100 gets you all of the above plus your name in the back of the book, and $250 gets you everything plus this limited edition cloth print, Japanese cloth print. There's another option for $2,500 for a one-day tour of Tokyo by Mr. Mod that nobody bought, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so you, you can go to the site and you pledge. And you know the biggest, I think, inhibitor for giving money or, or supporting creative projects is, what if I give my money but they don't reach their goal? Well, the way Kickstarter works is that but at the end of the month, if you haven't reached the goal, nobody pays. They act as an escrow service. So essentially, at the end of the month, if you've reached that $15,000 goal, automatically everyone's credit cards are charged. It's a really brilliant, simple service. And so in the end of one month, for this niche book about Tokyo, about art in Tokyo, I mean, you can't really get more niche than this. We were able to raise $24,000 for the reprint. In fact, we hit that, that $15,000 mark halfway through the campaign. But not only did we get $24,000 using this service, we were able to build up a fan base of 300 core people who were financially invested in where that project was going. So in the end, let me give you the numbers. $20,000, because they take a bit of a percentage off the top, $20,000 equal 1,300 new books. These are expensive books. We produce them in Japan. They're two color, two color uh, um, silk screening, one color uh, foil stamping with uh, two color throughout on beautiful papers. Um, but it paid for 1,300 books, it paid for my meager salary for three months, it paid for a launch party, it paid for all the shipping, and it paid for uh, being able to support uh, my co-author and also the illustrator who was part of the project. And so the old book we sold for $29.50. The old book that we published through the traditional venues using our distributor in the U.S. Uh, for national distribution. And when you go through a national distributor, they're selling on the model of essentially mass market. So they were saying to us, you've got to price this niche book of which there weren't even many at a mass market price, which was somewhat unsustainable for us. So we priced that $29.50, which was way, way too low for what we were doing. And so over six months using that traditional method, we actually only pulled in $5,500. And this was in revenue, not even profits. So you can start to understand why indie presses are so lean and why so many of them run off grants. Now the new book, we had an opportunity to eschew all this uh, traditional distribution methods, and I sell direct. I'm using the internet to sell direct. And this is a niche book. There aren't that many of them. It's a limited book. So we priced it, what we needed to price it at, in order to create a sustainable business out of this. And so $49.50 was the price we put for that book. And in one month, we were able to raise 
we were able to get over $5,000 in sales. And this is not revenue, this is pure profit that can be reinvested into the project or other similar projects. So when you ask the question, how does digital affect publishing? It affects it in the funding, it affects it in the, the distribution, it affects it in the marketing, it affects it in the fan base, the community building. And if you notice, I haven't talked much about Artifact because to be honest, I think some of the most interesting things moving forward with publishing in books doesn't have to do with the artifact. We're gonna kind of figure out how books should look in iPads and things like that. And in fact, the final artifact is gonna become more and more fuzzy as we move forward. And in fact, the things that we, I think, that are the most interesting to look at are these pre-artifact systems. How, what leads up to the book? From the idea of, it, from the inception of an idea to getting that idea in the hands of your readers. How can you modify that system using digital means and network connectivity and tools like Kickstarter to do that better and more sustainably? And then after the book's out, and this is a totally another talk, after the book is out, after the artifact is completed, how do you engage with that, continue to engage with that moving forward? That's the post-artifact system. So even though these books look the same, they're drastically different. And in the end, Kickstarter gave us the opportunity as a publisher to produce twenty to fifty thousand dollars of profit on this book, and if you've talked to any other independent pro publishers, that's a tough thing to do. That's a, that's a really tough thing to pull out. And so I took all of this, and again, publishing now doesn't necessarily just mean books. It doesn't necessarily mean magazines. I took this experience because this was an experiment more than anything else, and I wrote it up. I did a four thousand word write up on on exactly what I did to make this happen. It was easy. Anybody can do this. My goal is to get 50 people to raise $25,000, which is a million and a quarter, in, in untapped funds that can be used for creative projects like all of you are working on. Now, out of all of this, there's a new type of indie publisher that's emerged. And it's an indie publisher that doesn't even know they're going to be a publisher. This is what's so exciting is that now publishing, it, it can be a one-off thing if you want it to be. If you just want to do one book, you can just do one book. The infrastructure costs that you needed 10 or 15 or 20 years ago aren't there anymore. So let's travel back actually to 2006. There's a company called 37 Signals, which is still around today. And they published a book called Getting Real. Now what 37 Signals was doing had nothing to do with publishing and they were writing a really popular blog. And they had about 100,000 readers, and they were writing about business, new ways of doing business, and they were, had some pretty radical ideas, and they had, a, they had a pretty strong following. And what they did is they, without knowing it, knowing it or not, they modified this publishing cycle. So they went from idea to word, sentence, paragraph, chapter, as a blog post, connect that with the reader. And after a couple of years of writing these blog posts through there's sort of this built-in feedback loop of the number of comments or the number of links or the number of hits on, it, on an entry, sort of indicating interest about a certain topic. They thought, well, you know, actually, we have a lot of good content here. What if we curated this and put it together and released it as a book? And so that's what they did. They were writing a book without knowing it as they were doing their blog, and their readers were engaging with that writing process without knowing it. And so they put this book out in 2006 as a PDF, right? They, a PDF, right? <coughs> They sold it for $19, and they sold 30,000 of them. And this is a number from 2006. I actually emailed Jason, the president of the company, and I said, can you give me updated numbers? And he didn't have any on hand. But 30,000 sold in 2006 for $19. This is over half a million dollars in pure profit. There's no distribution. You're, you're speaking directly to your, to your audience. You know, Seth Godin recently in August said, now I know who my readers are. I don't need to go with traditional publishing anymore. I'm connected with my readers. I don't need this network. I don't need to go through the circuitous route of the publisher and the printer and the distributor and the bookstore. I can go direct. Another example is uh, a company called A Book Apart. And this is from this year. This is a recent example. And the interesting thing about 37 Signals is that in 2006 they did a PDF. And in 2010, A Book Apart is doing physical books. And so A Book Apart had this amazing community behind it as it was, as it was basically founded. They had a list apart, which had 10 years of history publishing and writing about the web. They had Zeldman behind it, they had Jason Santa Maria, and they had a working library. These are all people with strong communities. So when they released their book this year in May, they sold 10,000 copies in the first two months. 50-50 profit they operate at as a publisher with the authors. We can assume maybe about $8 of production costs per copy, and they're selling it for $18. So $10 a book in profit means $100,000 in profit into the publisher, which means the author of this book, Jeremy Keith, he was able to get $50,000 in two months for an 80-page book about HTML. And if you don't think that's insanely innovative and exciting, then I don't know what is. Because if you've been looking at Indie Press 
for the last 10 years, you realize that no one has been able to do anything like this. And these guys didn't even plan on being a publisher. They woke up one day and realized we had this amazing community. Let's engage it. All of this is inspiring. All of this, to me, is just super inspiring because it's never been easier to access and touch publishing. And I think that this is really the change that digital is bringing to things that we tend to overlook by this focus on the artifact. The artifacts will get figured out. So my little do to you is really, really simple. It's just read a book digitally. Give it a try. Try reading an entire book on your iPhone or on your iPad or on your Kindle. Go through the entire thing. Engage that experience and think about what you liked and what you didn't like about it and be vocal about it. This is, this is, this is, we're in a period right now, two to three to five years maybe, where things are happening and changes are happening in the publishing industry that are going to set the course for things for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And you have a chance to watch that evolve and engage it. And that's a really cool thing. And so the big do, like I said before, is just publish. Think about how publishing can engage with what you do. And so since this is meant to be sort of out of your comfort zone, and since I'm really bad with names, I'm going to give this a little try. So for Peter, let's make a book out of your soil that you can plant in when you're done reading it. Alex, your architecture, it seems to be uh, really obsessed with this beautiful way of deconstructing artifacts. Let's build an artifact of all the artifacts you killed that you light on fire when you're done with it. Mark, two words, Colin t-shirt. Matt, sci-fi in the future for the kids of today. Take that design ethos of those books of yesterday that, in, that inspired you and let's build something for the kids of tomorrow that inspire them in the same way. James, everything you're doing here is connected with publishing and it's beautiful and we love you for it and we are so grateful for it. Steve, you are my new hero of this week, by the way. And I'm thinking chimpanzee plus fashion guide. <laughs> Phil, if you're not doing the do book, then that's something I think you should start doing. Maggie, everything you are act activated with right now can be enhanced. Your, your, your message can be spread. You can not only use books as a way to get your message out, but also you can make books with these kids. The bar is that low right now. You can show them that this is possible. They can make a book. You can make a book with these kids. That's a powerful thing. David. David, your to-do list is already too long. I'm not going to bother with you. Um, <laughs> Paula, what you're doing with Creative Commons is the glue that holds all of this together, that makes all of this possible. Thank you for that. Jay, I'd love to see your curation of all the best designs put out there to help further your message and further what Local Motors is doing. Alistar, if you don't have a book out already, and if there are even a thousand books about what you're engaging, chances are I think you could write the most elegant one because you are a damn eloquent speaker, my friend. This morning, Ed, obviously, if you want to spread that word, use publishing. You're already doing it online. And publishing doesn't have to be books. It doesn't have to be physical things. It doesn't have to be EPUB. It doesn't have to be PDF. And Tim, even though the internet is full of pornography and Fox News, and you know, our apologies for that, um, <laughs> what you've built and what you've enabled and that technology has made all of this possible. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And Dan, you have a book coming out next year. And I am really excited to see how this book helps you spread the ideas and the amazing things that you've been engaged with. And so I thank you all because you've all inspired me to reconsider all of these different types of publishing endeavors that we can engage with and that I hope you take the time to think about it too. Thank you. <laughs>